Thank you very much. Good evening. This is uh, the special board meeting, the special board of directors meeting for Wednesday, April 5th, 2023. This is your chair, Steve Conklin. Uh, just a quick note that this is called as a special board meeting so that if we take action or want to take action, we could do so. It doesn't presuppose that our goal is to necessarily take action, but if we had not called this as a special board meeting, we would not be able to. So just wanted to start out with that information. With that, I will ask uh, Melinda to do the roll call. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, and just for new members, uh, as we're getting people pulled over, if I call your name and you're not able to respond, I will check back in at the end of roll call uh, to make sure you're accounted for. All right, here we go. Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Lynn Baca, Adams County. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Here. Claire Levy, Boulder County. Ashley Stolzman, Boulder County. Austin Ward, City and County of Broomfield. Here. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. Here. Nicholas Williams, City and County of Denver. Kevin Flynn, City and County of Denver. Here. George Teal, Douglas County. Abe Layden, Douglas County. Marie Mornis, Gilpin County. Tracy Craft Tharp, Jefferson County. Leslie Dahlkemper, mm. Jefferson County. Lisa Smith, City of Arvada. Here. Dustin Zvonek, City of Aurora. Here. Larry Vidum, Town of Bennett. Here. David Spellman, City of Blackhawk. Nicole Spears, City of Boulder. Margo Ramson, Town of Omar. Jan Plowski, Brighton. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Here. Tim Dietz, Castle Rock. Here. Tammy Mauer, Centennial. Present. Todd Williams, Central City. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Earl Holland, Cherry Hills Village. Here. Craig Hurst, Commerce City. Susan Noble, Commerce City. Catherine Whitman, Decono. Othaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Cheryl Wink, Inglewood. Ari Harrison, Erie. Here. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen, Federal Heights. Don Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Here. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Ryan Tushare, Glendale. Paul Hazeman, Golden. Here. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Here. Stephanie Walton, Lafayette. Hello. Jeslyn Sherazai, Lakewood. Here. Stephen Barr, Littleton. Kyle Schlachter, Littleton. Kat Bristow, Lockbuoy. Here. Wynn Shaw, Lone Tree. Here. Joan Peck, Longmont. Dietrich Hoffner, Louisville. Here. Holly Rogan, Lions. Greg Edding, Lions. Colleen Whitlow, Mead. Here. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Tom Mahold, Nederland. Richard Kondo, Northland. Tim Long, Northland. John Dyack, Parker. Here. Sally Daigle, Sheridan. Neil Shaw, Superior. Ow. Jessica Sandgren, Thornton. Julia Marvin, Thornton. Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Bruce Baker, Westminster. <laughs> Bud Starker, Wheat Ridge. Darius Pakbaz, CDOT. Here. Sally Chafee, CDOT. Brian Welch, RTD. All right, uh, and at this point, uh, if you can raise your virtual hand and you weren't able to respond during the roll. Okay, I have Josie Cockrell. I have Stephen Barr, Tom Mahold, Randy Wheel. All right, oh, Claire Levy, Sarah Nermella, Nicole Spear. All right, 
And with that, Mr. Chair, uh, we do have a quorum, so I will hand it back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, can I get a motion to approve our agenda for the evening? So moved. Okay, Mr. Wheelock, thank you. And second, second. Uh, from Director Harmon, thank you very much to both of you. Uh, all in favor of approving the agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? And any abstentions? We have an agenda, thank you very much. Report of the chair, my comment is incredibly brief. Uh, we have a lot to cover tonight and we'll talk about that more as, as we go on, but uh, just gonna do the best I can to, to be sure that people have the opportunity to speak. Balancing that with uh, moving through and, and you're getting the information out. So thank you for being here on this virtual meeting. Uh, I am actually at the Dr. Cog offices with uh, Director Rex, uh, but otherwise, uh, we will move forward. So with that, uh, we'll start with public comment, uh, as is uh, the case in all of our meetings, up to 45 <clears> minutes <throat> allocated now for public comment. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time could be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. I request that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Uh, do we have public comment? Ms. Melinda? Do you see? Uh, at this time, Mr. Chair, I do not see any hands raised. Okay. We will move forward then with the consent agenda. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda, which is the summary of the March 15th, 2023 meeting? Um, uh, Director Ward. So moved. Thank you. And a second from Director Shaw. Correct. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. All in favor of the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? And any abstentions? Okay, thank you very much. We'll move to our first item, which is an informational briefing on the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Climate Pollution Reduction Grant, or CPRG program. Uh, we do have a guest, which is... Casey Becker, uh, the EPA Region Aid Administrator, thank you for being here. Uh, I will turn it to Robert Spots to begin the conversation, Manager for Transportation Planning and Operations. Robert? Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And I'm just gonna go ahead and turn it right over to Casey to just introduce this grant opportunity. Hi, everyone. I'm Casey Becker. Can you all hear me all right? Yes. Great. Um, so uh, great to be joining Dr. Cog today. I. Um, uh, remember when I was uh, my city's representative to Dr. Cog when I was on city council in Boulder, if anyone had ever come to us with an opportunity like this, I, I think we would have um, not believed it. But as you all know, Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act in um, August of last year. And part of that is $5 billion, that's a billion with a B, for climate pollution reduction grants. The initial part of those grants are $250 million that is available to each state non-competitively. And then the 67 largest metropolitan areas in the United States and Denver's in um, the Denver MSA is in that list of 67. Those states are um, all of the states that accepted it. And it was 46 out of 50 states have accepted the grants. Um, and are, 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 they're planning grants for climate pollution reduction. And then the 67 biggest metropolitan statistical areas, the states get 3 million, the cities get um, $1 million each. And if a, a city doesn't take it, it then goes, we go down the list to the next biggest metro area in the United States on that list. So we are here just, um, we met with the city of Denver and said, uh, you all are on this list. You get a million dollars to to plan for how you, as a as a met, metro area, want to plan for climate pollution reduction. And um, we didn't say it's the city of Denver. We just said it's the Denver metro statistical area, which includes, um, you know, a, a larger area, not as big as Dr. Cog, but Denver and that group said we think that this should be um, we we should be turning to Dr. Cog to help. Um, lead this effort on um, accepting the million dollars and then actually doing the planning for climate pollution reduction grants. And so one thing I wanna say is once you take the 
uh, if you choose to take on this responsibility and get the million dollars to start planning for your MSA, how you're going to reduce climate um, pollution, that basically unlocks an, um, $4.6 billion that is the rest of the climate pollution reduction grant. So the first stage is a planning grant that we're talking about today. The next stage, um, once you sort of meet certain hurdles in that planning grant, is it unlocks additional, uh, significant additional money um, to reduce climate pollution. So, so some of the things I really like about this is it allows you to really tailor the tailor your climate plan for what you want to do most. What is best? What you know? What fits New York City is not going to be what's best for the Denver metro area. How do you all want to prioritize and plan for climate pollution? Is that in the building sector, the transportation sector, the energy sector? But but you get to sort of really. Um, you know, within some, some parameters, plan out how you see the best opportunities um, to reduce climate pollution, and then um, build a plan that, that you can then um, submit for additional grants. So it's the biggest amount of money we've ever seen out of Congress to help reduce climate pollution. Um, the state will be developing its own plan, which will have a, a statewide lens. So this is an opportunity um, for you as a region to really coordinate um, amongst yourselves, work together to really identify the best solutions um, for the Denver MSA area. That's my intro. I think the Dr. Cog staff is gonna go into more detail um, about like specifically what you'd be taking on and what you'd be developing. Um, but I do wanna encourage um, Dr. Cog to do this. I think it's a great opportunity and having the input from all the you know, the counties, the small cities, the small towns, big cities, I think is a great approach and I think can really um, set up the region for success and really uh, put us on a region to, to reducing climate pollution and, and have a lot of control um, in, in what you all want to advance, what you all want to apply for. So that's my um, intro to it. I think it's really exciting. I don't know if you all want me to take any questions now. I think again, um, the staff is <clears throat> going to go into more detail. Um, I think that's Robert's going to go into more detail and more specifics, but um, just wanted to say thanks for having the meeting. Thanks for taking it on and uh, or hopefully you'll be taking it on and um, and that's about it. And it's always good having board alumni back. So thank you for being here. Uh, we'll hold off on questions for you specifically until after Robert finishes, and then we'll we'll kind of address questions from there. So Robert, and, hey. and Robert, before you speak up, I might have to drop off. I'm sitting in the Denver airport, okay. um, but my chief of staff, Kelly Watkins, will be here um, to answer any questions if I'm not available. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so uh, I got some assist there from uh, from Casey. So hopefully I can cruise through some of these slides. But as she mentioned, $5 billion total. EPA is administering these grants. That first uh, set of money, $250 million, uh, she described, but $1 million is coming to the Denver metro area. Um, and we've communicated with some of our local sustainability partners here, including the city of Denver. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about the potential of Dr. Cog being the lead agency in this effort. And as she mentioned, um, critically, the, these, this planning grant unlocks the ability to compete in the competitive process for $4.6 billion. Um, you know, we've heard that that could be wide, wide range of funding levels. The largest grant could be over $100 million. Um, that part of the project or the program has not been fully established yet. The guidelines and the timeline for releasing those funds, except that those funds could start being unlocked as early as Q1 2024. So as, as she mentioned, it is for the Denver Metropolitan Statistical Area technically, so that that's the pink in this map here. It does not align perfectly with the Dr. Cog boundary. So any agency that does this will also be doing work for with and for Park and Elbert County for things like inventories and targets. Uh, but that does not mean we can't include our friendly neighbors that are outside of the metropolitan statistical area. We've had initial conversations with uh, Boulder 
see if they are interested in Southwest Weld. Preferably, we'd like to keep this to um, the Dr. Cog boundary so it aligns with um, our membership and our jurisdiction. So the, there's three deliverables over four years that are required from this $1 million planning grant. The first is due in kind of rapid fire time. It's by March 1st, 2024. Um, we're required to have a priority climate action plan. Um, so that, that's really just near term, term goals, things that we can um, establish and get on the ground as soon as possible. Two years from the time the grant is received, that would be so the money will come to this region sometime in summer of 2025. Two years from that date, a more comprehensive action plan um, is required. And then finally, a status report two years after that. To get into some of the specific components of each of these plans, the priority climate action plan requires inventory authority to implement quantify GHG measures and some first, um, you know, early action things that would set up the, the region to apply for grants and some programs that could be enacted, put into place in the short term. The comprehensive climate action plan takes, includes those elements, perhaps even a little bit more refined since you've had more time to develop them, as well as additional um, components that are necessary. Each one of these components there's guidance for on EPA's website and EPA has stressed that they will willing and able to assist um, both in terms of guidance as well as uh, technical support. So near-term actions, um, this, this grant was announced on March 1st, so it's been kind of a whirlwind um, figuring it out and establishing what makes the most sense for this region with our, our, some of our partners. But the, the, that, that's just the beginning. Um, it, is, it will be important to develop a coalition of local governments, the state and the Regional Air Quality Council, how to participate, um, some type of governance structure, what are the roles and responsibilities of each agency and how can they all contribute those that want by April 28th, so that's only, uh, what, 23 days from now, uh, one agency must submit a notice of intent to participate. That, that would be designated as the lead agency or the grant recipient. And then by May 31st, the application for the lead agency is due. That includes many elements, including uh, the proposed work plan, the budget, how, how to spend the $1 million, as well as a bunch of government paperwork. So why might this make sense for the Dr. Cog region uh, to do, you know, I think there's been efforts similar to this in the past where, um, you know, in, in all the work we do as a region, there are economies of scale and, and reaching out and coordinating with our partners to get this best product at the regional scale. It also matches, um, you know, some of the, some of the systems that create, that are, create greenhouse gas pollution are regional um, pollution generators. So it, regional level of air quality and greenhouse gas planning um, ties in with some of the, the generators. And then, you know, critically, it positions um, any local government that's under the umbrella of this plan, as well as the region itself, to tap into this $4.6 billion of implementation grants nationwide. They've also stressed that, you know, this could be an opportunity to prepare yourselves for BIL and IIJA funds, as well as funding opportunities arise from those bills. Um, so, you know, Dr. Cog uh, makes sense potentially to be the lead agency because we, uh, our boundary really does closely match the metropolitan statistical area, although not exactly. You know, this aligns with our greenhouse gas uh, re emission reduction strategies that are outlined in MetroVision, and it expands beyond that. This is not just a transportation project. This, uh, this program would go beyond our normal kind of transportation and land use planning um, types of priorities and go into new, um, new areas where Dr. Cog hasn't typically done, but eager to evaluate those. Um, and you, but that's not to say it doesn't have the opportunity to fund some of the projects and programs that are represented in our long range plan um, and others identified by MetroVision. Um, we've done some initial reach out um, to a local sustainability network here, then uh, several local governments uh, collaborate and coordinate. Uh, they're in support of Dr. Cog uh, leading this effort. Air Quality Council is in support of us leading this effort. We're presenting to them on Friday about the opportunity. And then the City and County of Denver's Climate Action, Sustainability and Resiliency Division, um, who potentially could be the lead agency, has recommended that Dr. Cog be the lead agency. 
I do want to stress, though, that if Dr. Cog takes on this leadership role, there is no requirement for agencies that have no interest in this uh, effort to participate. Um, there, there will be opportunities to collaborate for those that want to and are able to. Um, and if local agencies do have uh, existing greenhouse gas plans, it does not replace those. Uh, it does not have to be exactly like them, nor does it have to align with the efforts that the state are doing. This would be our plan as a region. Um, and then this, this, this is not going to create new regulations or rules. There will not be requirements for those, again, that do not want to participate. And again, it will enable us to pr pursue uh, those implementation plans. We've had some just brief initial discussions about how could we use this $1 million. Um, and I, the most important near-term thing will be to have that conversation. Initially, um, some concepts have been to hire a full-time staff person uh, you know, that would work under this grant, charge this grant, and focus on the coordination and planning. Um, another option or a supplement to that would be to hire a consultant to assist with our, our products and deliverables and advise. So uh, over the next year, should Dr. Cog choose to pursue this leadership role, um, we would come back to you in just two weeks from now um, to consider approval of a resolution supporting Dr. Cog submitting the notice of intent to participate. Uh, just a week after that, that notice of intent to participate would be due to EPA. Uh, we'd work diligently and quickly to develop the budget and the work program as best we can, coordinating with uh, local agencies that would like to participate. And as early as May 17th, we'd have that uh, budget approved by Dr. Cog's Finance and Budget Committee. By May 31st, the grant applications due. Then, you know, it's a really short term time frame for something as complicated and large as a climate action plan, but it'd be seven, nine months of uh, planning, giving the Dr. Cog board updates as necessary. And to meet that March 1st, 2024 deadline for the priority climate action plan, Dr. Cog board would take action on May, February 21st, 2024. Um, that's just the first step of this program. As you saw, we have another year and change uh, to get the comprehensive climate action plan developed. But after that March 1st deadline, that's when the implementation grant money is proposed to start rolling out. And that is my presentation. I am happy to take any questions. Uh, Director, uh, and I apologize for the pronunciation. Okay. Zavonic. 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 Zavonic, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, a couple, one comment and then some questions. On the comment side, you'd asked about, or there was the consideration of whether we hired somebody or consultant. I would think that because this is very one time in nature, it would be better, just my opinion, to. Uh, to hire a consultant that would administer the program, make sure the funds get out. Questions are in this area, because it's a big area and, and a million dollars is in a small amount of money, but there's lots of local governments that are in there. So does this include cities and counties or just cities that could apply for the, the funds? So uh, any, any local government or air quality, um, agency or MPO and a few probably others are able to apply for uh, the MSA. So one agency within the MSA is to become the lead agency. If right. there's disagreement about that, as, as if as multiple people applied for the notice of intent to participate as a leadership role, Got it. The, the agency that gets the final word is the largest city in the region. So that would be the city of Denver at the end of the day has total authority, but EPA would like prefer, uh, uh, you know, the agencies within that MSA to work it out themselves and, and decide who the lead agencies should be. Okay, that makes sense. And then uh, follow last question, I guess, is that um, are there, in terms of flexibility of the types of um, things that could be considered as this? So one example would be, could things as small as equipment, right? Re replacing qu equipment that would we would move towards electrification of equipment. Is, are those the types of things, and I'm not suggesting that maybe that doesn't fit in the plan, but would it, could it potentially be something that we would uh, consider? I think certainly, I mean, Casey's still here, I see, but you know, I think they have not defined how the implementation grant process is going to work exactly or what will be eligible, okay. but certainly, you know, I, it sounds to me like anything that helps reduce climate pollution could right. theoretically be eligible under this grant. Okay. okay. Do you That's mind all. if I jump in? Uh, Dustin, you, you can, yeah. you all um, can put in the plan what you want. Um, okay. there, there are some requirements in terms of just, you know, trying 
covering each sector. But what you put in the plan just be, is helps you inform if you want to apply for a later implementation grant. You get to choose from that plan what you want to apply for, what you, you know, think would have the best shot of, of getting those later grants. Those later grants are competitive. There, it's four point six billion dollars that's available, but I bet we'll get a lot more um, requests for grants. So the first million dollars is, you know, local governments coordinating on a plan. The next phase will be, okay, now that we have the plan, now that you all have your plan, what what do you, you know, want to want to put forward as as a grant? Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Director Shazai. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I just had uh, one point of clarity. The million dollars is for like our whole metro area. It's not the, the number 67 was thrown around. There's not 67 different pots of a million dollars available to large areas in Colorado. No, that's, that's six, nationwide. Oh, yes. Yeah. Nationwide. Okay, great. And then just one comment, you know, we have, uh, I represent the city of Lakewood and we have uh, planners that are focused on sustainability. Um, as um, Ms. Becker said, we're very excited about this opportunity and very energized for the option for um, Dr. Cog to sort of take a leadership role in this. So that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Any final questions? Robert, any uh, closing comments or Casey, any closing comments? Kelly. Kelly Watkins, please. Hi, uh, Kelly Watkins. I'm the Chief of Staff for EPA Region 8. Nice to see you all. I just wanted to remind you that um, we have an invite that went out, hopefully, to all of you on the call for a, an initial kickoff coordination meeting tomorrow afternoon. And so I hope you all will be able to join. And if you did not receive that, please feel free to drop me an email. Um, Robert has my contact information and I will add you to the invite. Look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. And Robert, any final thoughts? No, just thanks for the opportunity and yeah, looking, looking forward to next steps. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we will move on to uh, our next item, action item, discussion on state legislative issues, Senate Bill 23. 213. Just a couple of comments from me, and then we'll move into that process. Uh, housing challenges in our state are affecting every one of our communities in various ways. As a board, Dr. Cog has recognized the regional approaches are critical as we navigate a shared regional housing market. We've talked about that in various settings. Uh, as a board, we've contemplated and proposed collaborative work to address housing supply and affordability through a regional housing strategy. We have worked through land use and transportation scenario planning and have made key determinations about aligning growth with transportation investments. That said, our state elected leaders have expressed a commitment to addressing our state's housing challenges as well. We recognize that SB 23213 introduces processes and statewide mandates that do not necessarily align with many local communities. We've heard many local elected bodies will be opposing the bill. As we think about what would be most helpful for Dr. Cock at this point, we uh, should be strategically considering and articulating what we as a regional planning council would propose for the future of housing in our region, which may come from this. And this conversation will help inform staff as we talk about what our, our issues are. As a kickoff, we would like to, and again, I, I want to restate that we called this as a special meeting, not presupposing that we will take a stand necessarily, but if we choose to take a stand, we could not do so if we didn't have this as a special meeting. With that said, if we reach the point that we look at taking a stand, we need to know what we have abstention-wise and support-wise. We would like right now, if you know at the outset of this conversation that you representing your community would have to abstain from any vote on opposing or supporting, can you please signify by raising your virtual hand so we can just get a count as to uh, who we know would have to abstain. Okay, give it just another moment here. So it looks like we have 12 that know that they would have to abstain. Okay, if you can lower your hands, we would appreciate that. With that, we would also like to do just a straw poll, even before we get into the presentation. If you know that you are supporting 
SB 213, can you please raise your virtual hand? Okay, if you can lower your hand. If you know right now that you would be opposing SB 213, can you please raise your hand? Okay, give it another moment. Okay, that just as as obviously that is not uh, binding, but that helps us just as we can begin the presentation to to kind of know where we stand on some of these issues. With that, I will start by turning it over to Sheila Lynch, Director of Regional Planning and Development, to give us just kind of an overview before we get into more of a discussion. Sheila, great. Thank you, Chair Conklin. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm joined tonight um, also with Andy Taylor, our manager of regional planning and data analytics. We're gonna kind of share share the show today to um, help us walk through some information to get us started on this discussion. So all of you have been engaged in many discussions around housing, and several of them have happened at the Dr. Cog. Um, table. And so we wanted to ground us a little bit in where we've been over the last few months talking about housing and how as a regional organization we wanted to uh, move forward with working together on housing issues. Um, and then we'll spend some time um, providing some information about um, Senate Bill 23-213. So I wanted to touch a little bit, even diving back a little, about a year ago, the board had their annual retreat and um, the board really spent significant amount of time thinking about what would regional housing work look like? It included a survey, um, you went through a question um, storming activity, and it culminated in an exercise to define Dr. Cog's unique assets and roles for addressing housing. At the December and February board work sessions, we defined um, what this regional housing work would look like even further. And some of the things that we heard from all of you were things like, there's a need for regional coordination around housing. Um, also further data analysis to really define the problem related to housing in our region that a piece of this work had to include technical assistance and also policies and programs that would better address housing across our region. And then in, in February, um, the board got to a discussion about what would a regional housing strategy look like and started to have some preliminary conversations around scoping that regional housing strategy. And it included talking about the need for defining some shared goals and objectives to address the, the problems of housing that you would like to collectively work together on. Um, it would also need to include adaptable technical assistance because no community across our region is alike and that technical assistance need, needed to meet the needs um, of communities where they were at. And then lastly that um, you know we really needed to focus as a region on the pieces of the challenge or the problem that local governments really would have a hard time addressing on their own. So we get to today and uh, we have a Senate bill in front of us that I know many of you have, have dived pretty deep into. And so we thought today that it would be helpful to um, spend some time on this bill to share some information just to make sure that we're all, um, I guess, discussing from the same uh, level of understanding of the bill. And then our other key objective is really to gain some guidance from all of you on how best to proceed. And for, for us at Dr. Cog, your staff, we, we'd like to understand too, what kind of um, things are important to you around this bill and um, provide some guidance to all of us as we, as we walk through this. So there are many components of the bill as introduced. Um, 
And as you can imagine at Dr. Cog, there's a lot around what geographies are included and which geographies apply in different situations. So we dove right into trying to do some mapping. And our wonderful GIS team spent a significant amount of time in the last week and a half really trying to understand the bill and to show it on a map. So this map shows the four key geographies that are defined in the bill as, as introduced. The uh, four, four geographies include a tier one urban municipality, a tier two urban municipality, a rural resort job center municipality, and a non-urban municipality. In the Denver region, we have tier one and tier two urban municipalities. And the definitions for all of these, we won't dive into all the details, but I'll just give you an idea of how the bill describes them. So the definitions are based on whether communities are within an MPO or not, the size of the MPO that they're within, the population size of the community, the size of the county that they're in, and in rural resort communities, um, it includes more specificity around the number of jobs in that community. You'll also see in our, oops, just want to go back one second, I forgot to mention that you'll also see a lot of white space or places that seem like are not one of those geographies. And there's a number of different reasons for that. Um, but the big piece is that unincorporated portions of the counties are not necessarily defined as one of these four geographies. All right, well, the first section of the proposed bill focuses on housing needs assessments and housing needs plans. Um, we wanted to make sure there's a lot of moving parts in this bill. And so we wanted to put on one slide of just a summary of what we're talking about here. So what's proposed in the bill is that the executive director of DOLA will issue a methodology for a statewide housing needs assessment. And then from that housing needs assessment, rural needs assessments and local needs assessments will be developed. What, um, the, the time frame for the data or the information that will be pulled from is that the, the DOLA will look at using a 25 year housing forecast. And then the frequency of these assessments are proposed as every five years. The only jurisdictions or those geographies I just described that, be, that will be required to develop um, or that will be using these will be tier one and tier two urban municipalities and rural resort job center municipalities. And those communities will use these assessments to then develop what they're calling a housing needs plan. And the the timeline for developing these plans um, will be municipalities will be required to turn in a needs plan by December 31st, 2026. And what's going to be included in those needs plans are a narrative of the stakeholder engagement, an analysis of a realistic opportunity for housing development, uh, greenfield development analysis, and that goes, I won't go into great detail, but that's described in the bill. Two strategies from what they're describing as a menu of affordability strategies, and that's described in the bill. Two um, transit-oriented development strategies, if applicable, if you have those areas in your community. Also what's included is um, developing strategies around displacement and then um, articulating how those strategies will be implemented. Another key piece of this is that housing needs assessments will need to be incorporated into comprehensive plans. All right, so there are four key, what, what has been described as policy areas of this bill. There is an, a section on accessory dwelling units. There's a section of the bill on middle housing. There's a section of the bill on transit oriented areas. And then a section of the bill on corridors. Andy's gonna dive into greater detail on those um, different parts of the bill. But I wanted to, to give a, a brief overview on kind of where this applies generally. So as you can see in this table, 
for accessory dwelling units, those um, policies would apply in the tier one, tier two urban communities, the rural resort job center municipalities, and the non-urban municipalities. And then middle housing, that section of the bill as introduced would apply to tier one urban municipalities and rural resort job center municipalities. The transit oriented areas would be in the tier one urban municipalities and then the key corridors are in the tier one and then also the rural resort job center municipalities. On the on it, it, in the, every part of the bill, the, all the four parts, excuse me, there is a construct that we wanted to make sure we explained, and that is that in each of those sections there is a concept of minimum standards. So the idea is that the bill would articulate minimum standards for what is needed in those policy areas, and then if we go to the next slide. And then with those minimum minimum standards, municipalities would be asked to adopt minimum standards. And if those mi mi minimum standards were not adopted, then you'll see on the left, DOLA will de develop a model code. And then the municipality would have an uh, a choice to adopt that model code. And if no action is taken by the municipality at that date certain, then that model code comes goes into effect. With the minimum standards, municipalities would be submitting those to DOLA and DOLA would um, kind of approve those or give feedback that they don't meet the intent of the bill. So I'm going to hand it over to Andy and Andy's going to walk us deep, more deeply into the four sections of the bill. Thanks, Sheila. I've just got a few slides and maps uh, to go through the additional components of the bill, just as it's been introduced, starting with accessory dwelling units. As Sheila noted, these have the broadest applicability across all the municipality types called out in the bill. And within uh, these jurisdictions, ADUs would have to be allowed in any zoning district where single family detached dwellings are currently allowed by right. Uh, the blue box that describes some of the parcels where this wouldn't be applied describes where these would be exempt. Uh, the bill often refers to these as standard exempt parcels, but I've just listed those here so that uh, you can start to see where there are some carve outs. They're thinking ahead about where these rules wouldn't apply. Um, but the bill, as introduced, outlines a number of minimum standards. Um, I've just highlighted a few here, uh, but there, there are several more uh, listed in the bill. Um, ADUs must be allowed by right. Uh, there would be no additional off-street parking that could be required by the zoning uh, if someone wants to add an ADU. Uh, no zoning requirements think the design standards that you may have could be more restrictive than those in place for single family homes. Uh, beyond some of the dimensional uh, requirements, ADUs would need to be given the ability to locate closer to the rear property line uh, than most zoning would have in place for single family homes. So um, I've got a map just to remind you um, where those all apply. Um, as Sheila went through um, in our region, those are the uh, tier one and tier two urban municipalities. Uh, the middle housing provisions apply to a smaller set of jurisdictions. Uh, for our region, only the tier one urban municipalities um, would be subject to this, not the tier two urban municipalities. Uh, like the ADU provisions, uh, this component of the bill would require new minimum standards in the subject municipalities for any zoning districts where single family detached dwellings are currently allowed by right. And so this has the same list of standard exempt parcels uh, that we saw for the ADU section. Um, and again, I've just highlighted a few of the minimum standards the bill would call for, allowing structures containing up to six units. Uh, this also specifically calls out townhomes and um, what they've defined as cottage clusters. Again, it references that no additional off-street parking could be required for these. And again, uh, those design standards couldn't be more restrictive than those for a single family home. 
and actually um, beyond those dimensional standards, uh, those would actually have to allow for more buildable area uh, for middle housing, uh, those types I just described, than for single family homes currently. So they'd have to be slightly more permissive. Uh, conversions of existing structures, I didn't note this on the slide, conversions of existing structures would also have to be allowed under zoning, though it doesn't call for any changes to other regulations outside of zoning, uh, such as building code. So back to the map again, just as a reminder, uh, the middle housing section would only apply in our region to that tier one um, urban municipality, those uh, ones shaded in blue here. Uh, the rural resort uh, job centers are not present in our region. Uh, the bill's minimum standards for transit-oriented areas would only apply for tier one urban municipalities, uh, station areas, and unincorporated, area, unincorporated areas would not be subject to these minimum standards. Uh, and so this applies only inside the, the subject municipalities, these tier one urban municipalities within a half mile of fixed rail transit stations. It would include any parcel that is at least 25% in that half mile circle that they're establishing. Um, it does list the same standard exempt parcels as we just looked at under the last two sections, but these also include uh, exemptions for any area that in, any parcel that includes a park or open space or are otherwise subject to a conservation easement. And again, uh, some of these same standards are repeated. Again, no parking uh, what could be required through the zoning. And zoning would need to be amended for the area to achieve a density of 40 dwelling units per acre. Though there's flexibility if a jurisdiction is choosing to go this route, other than the model code, uh, allowing uh, for some more flexibility in where uh, this density uh, can apply, allowing uh, for some areas to transition uh, into other areas if they wanted to make some areas more dense and some areas less dense within this circle. So here are those transit oriented areas. Um, I'll point out again uh, what I just noted about the un, uh, unincorporated areas. We do have some that, that have station areas themselves, uh, so they would not be subject, uh, even though I'm showing them here. Uh, you may also note that we have station areas that are closer than a half mile from each other in terms of uh, these buffers, uh, these circles. And so these circles overlap and merge together uh, in, in some cases. Uh, the key corridor provisions, again, for our region, only apply to the tier one municipalities, uh, not the tier two urban municipalities. Uh, within these jurisdictions, key corridors would include parcels within a quarter mile of high frequency transit areas, bus rapid transit areas, and would also include planned service, not just the existing service that we have today. Um, beyond the standard exempt parcels that we've uh, looked at previously, there are also provisions to exempt industrial sites or sites that are adjacent to industrial sites or those zoned for industrial uses. Uh, but beyond the, the transit areas, there are other parcels that could be subject uh, to these key corridors uh, designations. Uh, these would be uh, those parcels that allow in their zoning uh, commercial or institutional uses uh, that, that are referenced or certain mixes therein. So those could be uh, subject to the same minimum standards, regardless of whether they have that transit proximity. Um, Subsequent rulemaking uh, would would uh, instruct communities on on how they would need to see uh, the capacity uh, increased for residential development in these areas, and I think critically um, what they're they may be trying to get at with this is to allow multifamily residential by right on all the the parcels that would be subject uh, that would be defined in these key corridor areas. We have a couple of maps showing some of these areas. We don't have a map that shows parcels allowing commercial or, in, or institutional uses, but we are showing here the, the current and future bus rapid transit. Again, this is going into some areas where it would not be applicable 
be that outside the urbanized area, outside the subject uh, municipalities, but this just gives you a sense of the, the network that we are planning for. And here's a map of the current high frequency transit areas. This doesn't reflect uh, future commitments uh, that RTD or others may have made for additional frequent transit service. So this is just what has been in place um, uh, for the first quarter of this year. Um, I think a lot of focus has been on the, the four uh, components of the bill that are uh, directly addressing uh, zoning requirements and changing minimum zoning requirements, but there are several other components of uh, the Senate bill that, that as introduced that are worth calling out. Um, this includes uh, new and re new required elements for county and municipal comprehensive plans. All these components you see on the slide here, these would apply to all jurisdictions, not just the these maps of subject municipalities or not. So. Um, and then just to close it out, I know a lot of the focus has been on, on zoning, uh, in different analyses of this bill, but just what we've noticed in our role at Dr. Cog as a metropolitan planning organization, where we're specifically already called out and the bill is introduced, um, they'd be using our boundary for the, the regional housing needs assessment. Uh, key corridors would, as I pointed out, would relate back uh, to those uh, MetroVision uh, regional transportation plan investments. Uh, we're also noted as users of the natural and agricultural land priorities report. There's also reference to MPOs like us that uh, could be um, recipients or pass through for technical assistance funding that is specified in the bill. Um, there's also state strategic growth objectives that are noted in the bill uh, that would need to be integrated in our next regional transportation plan. And I'll pass it back to Sheila. Great. Thanks, Andy. Um, I know that was a lot of content. You did a fantastic job of kind of breaking that 105 pages of the bill down. Um, I just wanted to add that um, our team has also been working on what we call a GIS story map to really take more of the information and try to visually understand it better. And we're doing our best to, to take it all in. And we imagine there'll probably be amendments along the way. And so we will continue to try to track that and have that available to all of you probably sometime next week. So thanks and let us know if you have any questions. A couple of things. We will open it up to comments and questions here in a moment, but I do want to just kind of set some parameters for us to, to be able to, to have as many people comment as possible. Would ask that if possible, limit your comments to two minutes, if at all possible. Uh, questions, comments, uh, so that everybody can, can get in. Uh, if possible, only comment once before we give everybody a chance to, to get in. If you agree with somebody's comments, all you have to do is say, I agree. Uh, but if, if there are other things, feel free to, to continue uh, and, and provide more information. Also, feel free to comment in chat. Staff will be keeping the comments that are in chat, and those will help inform them as, as they work on feedback, et cetera, to give uh, in the process. So with that, we'll open it up to questions and comments. Director Moby. Sorry, unmuting. Um, my statement's long and I'm going to submit it by writing and I don't want to repeat what I think other people are going to say. We do agree that the bill doesn't take into account the planning and zoning decisions to foster the same goals, which a town may have already implemented um, in a large growth area that's already undertaken. It removes the traditional policy of local control over landing and zone use, which I know others are going to speak on. My main comment may not be something others are going to comment on. It relates to HOAs who have a strong and strong voluntary covenants that run with the land. This is a little bit legal, but it's important because it's a real property right of individual families. Many HOA covenant rights evolve the allowable uses and prohibitions that are going to be changed by 213. So there's three points that I wanna make there. The first is relates to takings and eminent domain. 
there's very little legal authority for abrogating or take away, taking away the rights under eminent domain without a process that involves the owner. So for example, with eminent domain, there has to be a statement of community purpose. There has to be a right in a court process to actually uh, compensate the owner and demonstrate the need. And so it's a two-person process. The taking of those property rights and the use of property by a governmental entity under eminent domain is never ever done without a court process or without both parties weighing in. SB 23213 takes away that element of ownership and changes the use and value of land and basically puts an eminent domain process into place without a court process that's required. There's no justification on the local level for the specific changes that a municipality might put into place. And there's no compensation to a landowner whose land might be changed in a variety of respects, including value. So put differently, and more specifically, it's not clear to me that the sponsors and the proponents of the bill are, are knowing that they're taking a property right that's against the law and can be done cannot be done under any other means without due process of law. If it's enacted, it's going to be in its implementation a taking and contravention of state law and US Supreme Court law. My next point has to do with the very same problem. Dr. Moby, just briefly, you're at about two and a half minutes. So if you oh, could- Oh, sorry. Um, well, then I will just wrap up and say that by taking covenants and rights that run with the land, you're also doing the same thing in a different manner. And as a corollary, you're also going to require all of those deeds to be changed. There's a fiscal impact to that that hasn't been considered. So I would like the opportunity to submit this. It's twice as long as I've already spoken, but it specifies specific points and it subjects a municipality who has no right to change this process. It subjects the municipality to court challenge and extra costs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Director Shaw. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Great. Um, so I'm not as structured as Director Mulvey, but I want to bring up a couple of points, you know, that were in the slides that we're, we're still trying to wrap our heads around, you know, with the middle, uh, sort of the middle housing layer, it sort of excludes anything in the wildland urban interface. All of Superior is apparently in the wildland ur urban interface as a chunk of, of Louisville. And what we don't understand is a sort of relevance of that exclusion to this legislation. More importantly, what we have is we have a number of lots you know, where houses were burned down and people have put them up for sale. And what we don't understand is most of these homes are in a PD. So given this legislation, somebody could come along, buy those lots and put in a sixplex with no parking. Um, we are, in many cases, two or three miles away from any sort of public transportation. So the absence of required parking, the absence of any public transportation, is going to destroy the neighborhood, the character of the neighborhood, and actually make multimodal transportation for kids and anybody else that would not to drive actually very difficult because of the, the influx of cars into these areas. Beyond that, this legislation doesn't take into account any of the existing density that a community has. Superior is four square miles. We're about 6.7 residents per square acre. Um, if you compare that to Louisville, which is about four, Boulder County, the aggregate is only one. But this one size fits all disregards, you know, a community's focus on actually adding density over the past 20 years versus, you know, where the land may be cheapest. And what we unfortunately anticipate is people will buy up cheap lots, add in density, which is miles away from the actual jobs. And I would point to a, a couple of great pieces of, of uh, writing over the last few days. The Atlantic had some great uh, a great story over the weekend about how New York City sort of reinvented itself after September 11th to bring volume or bring density back to lower Manhattan. And the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago had some great literature about, you know, redeveloping acres of parking in Los Angeles and elsewhere. They actually referenced more in that story. There are great opportunities to bring the density back. However, it doesn't have to be you know, a one size fits all. Let's use the incentives to you know, draw the, uh, the homes where they need to be. That's about it. Thank you. Dr. Shaw, thank you very much. Uh, I have Directors Cockrell, Flynn, Maurer, and Vidim coming up. So Director Vidim, I do see your uh, actual hand will be to you in just a moment. Uh, Director Cockrell. Thank you. Um, great points being brought up already. Um, I represent the town of Foxfield. Um, in case you're not familiar with us, we are uh, basically the neighborhood at the southeast corner of Arapahoe and Parker Road. Um, we also have several 
uh, concerns regarding the bill. As a town of roughly 750 residents, this bill would not immediately apply to us. But like a handful of other Dr. Cog municipalities, we are just shy of the 1,000 person cutoff that would immediately make us become an urban tier one city. Um, like the entire Dr. Cog region, we are experiencing population growth. Our population growth has been slow, but I would expect to exceed a thousand within the near future. The label urban tier one city simply does not describe a town of a thousand people and certainly not Foxfield. We are generally described as close in rural and we incorporated specifically to protect the rural character that defines our small town. Because development has occurred around us, our attempts to maintain that rural character won't matter and we will go straight to being a tier one city. Our first suggestion would simply be to amend the definition of a tier one city to increase that minimum population to at least 2000, maybe even 5000 to match the definition of tier two. Areas such as Foxfield that are not particularly walkable and are not so well served by public transit don't make sense as targets for increased population density. In addition, many of our residents are served by private wells. There's no mention of private wells in this bill, so we would like to see clear language that clearly states that a property cannot be modified in any way that would violate the conditions of the well permit. Um, Finally, I just want to say that with a, this thousand person threshold, it's actually disincentivizing small communities to pursue some of the exact um, you know, affordable housing efforts that we are considering as well. We are in the process of considering ADUs, but if by adding ADUs that pushes us over the threshold, forcing us to allow middle housing that does not fit with our character, it disincentivizes us from even considering that option. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think I'd like to uh, ask if any other member has research similar to what CML has been doing. Uh, it occurs to me that approaches similar to this in California, Oregon, or the city of Minneapolis haven't really produced affordable housing in any sizable or, or impactful numbers. And uh, so to call this bill uh, something that is to encourage affordable housing, I don't see that it, I don't see the mechanism in it for doing that. In the city of Denver, we have unbuilt entitlements for residential uh, that could easily take care of our housing shortage, but they're not being built at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> So I, I'd like to see if, if any member community has done research on whether this actually incentivizes. What it's actually done is it's gentrified and displaced our vulnerable neighborhoods, like Overland, where my older son lived. Uh, affordable single units are being torn down and replaced with uh, duplex at this point. And, and the duplex units are selling for three to four times the value of the bungalow that they replaced. Uh, he he was forced to move to the uh, city of Sheridan. Not that there's anything wrong with the city of Sheridan, Sally, if you're here. Uh, so I, I do have uh, I do have a concern that this is going to put a bullseye on my vulnerable neighborhoods like Brentwood, Marley, maybe even Harvey Park, Fort Logan neighborhood, because I can guarantee that the economics of this are such that uh, you're not going to see scrape offs in Hilltop or Country Club. You're going to see them in my post-war Franklin Burns bungalow neighborhoods uh, that are at risk. So uh, I would uh, solicit any uh, any member here who has done the research on uh, on whether uh, an approach like this actually increases affordability uh, to share that with me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Director Flynn. We'll go to Director Maurer and then uh, Director Vidim. So Director Maurer, please. Thank you. Um, a city of Centennial um, last night at our city council meeting passed a resolution opposing uh, this, the statewide land use and zoning mandates and preemption of home rule in Senate Bill 23213. And I'll just give you some highlights. 
The City of Centennial commenced an extensive housing study and regulatory effort to provide housing options to address our local needs for affordability and attainable. With the Senate Bill 23213, it ignores all that the city has done and all of our efforts, wastes the city and taxpayers' resources previously committed to this effort. Over the Nearly 20 years, the city has approved the development of far more units of middle housing and higher density housing than single family dwelling units. And there's no consideration given to that. Um, the other thing is, it's this one size does not fit all when addressing housing. For example, uh, the city of Centennial, like many municipalities, does not provide or control necessary water or sanitation utilities. And these are done independently of the city. So this forces um, this this bill forcing to accept higher density without ability to consider without these utilities um, is, is very irresponsible. Um, the other thing is, is this bill uh, authorizes increase in density without providing ability to address density that would overload Centennial's local street networks. And there is no funding available to support improving our transportation networks. So the other thing that is very uh, unsettling for us is this effectively eliminates the constitutional right of Colorado residents enshrined in Article 6 of the Home Rule Charter and Title 31 of the Colorado Revised Statutes to redress their grievances when their government by eliminating local authority over local matters. This includes the rights of initiative and referendum. And then I agree with um, Director Mulvey on taking away the rights of the uh, property owners and especially in these HOAs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Director Pittam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Historically, a totalitarian government have worked on the concept of the collective. So the collective is a group of people that view themselves as more noble and more intelligent than the masses. So in their mind, the best outcome will be if they make all of the decisions. Historically, the collective consisted of kings and earls. In modern times, the collective consists of people who desire to be kings and earls. SB 213 is an effort by the collective to impose their will on the communities and the people of the state of Colorado. In my neighborhood, my town, apathy is a big problem. In the 10 years that I have been on the board of the town of Bennett, no single issue has caused the people of the town to roll their, their hand up in a fist and say over my dead body. So if you go into the eateries of the town of Bennett, the discussion includes number one, a recall of the three individuals who have sponsored this bill and discussions that say, anybody that votes for this bill will never be elected again because we will oppose them with our vote and with our money. So I implore, everybody in the sound of my voice to reject SB 213. Thank you for considering my thoughts. Thank you, Director Bittem. I will go to Director Levy in just a moment. And then after that, uh, staff, there was a comment from Director Spear regarding floodplain in the chat. If after uh, Director Levy speaks, we could have staff address the floodplain question. Director Levy. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and my last name is pronounced okay. Levy. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, I I wanted to address a couple of things. I don't have prepared remarks, um, but um, you, you, the uh, Sheila started by reminding us of the retreat that we had to look at opportunities for housing to better integrate housing and transportation. And so while um, Boulder County um, has real concerns with the bill, um, I, I think we should actually appreciate that with maybe some additional work and some amendments, there, there is some real possibility within this bill to try to get better coordination 
between areas in which there are going to be high density housing and transit, because one of the things we've really identified is that we have a transit system in the form of RTD that um, has to is forced to serve low density areas and, and they lose money doing it. Uh, and, uh, and we're losing opportunities to get more people into transit. And so I, I think there are opportunities within this bill to try to work on increasing density around transit nodes. And I think we should focus on those things to try to improve them. I also think the housing needs assessment provisions offer a real opportunity to look at where we do need housing, what is the kind of housing we need. But then I think where we part company with the bill is that we think having made that determination and having done that study, it really ought to be up to the local governments to figure out how to how to provide that housing. And I think others have pointed out that that many of the jurisdictions that are here in Dr. Cog are really working hard to provide the housing that they're that their um, employers need and that the people in their communities need. And I think this is gonna undermine those efforts. I think the other areas that, that we want, that we are really concerned about is, is that with all of the, the increased density that the bill mandates, there aren't commensurate provisions for affordability. And, uh, and the governor's working presumption is more, uh, more inventory equals lower cost. And we haven't seen that to be the case in Colorado where I, we're a highly desirable community and, and it's not gonna bring costs down. And so we need to see affordability provisions. Uh, the bill doesn't necessarily bring synchronicity between areas of increased density and the availability of transit or proximity to job centers. And so uh, it could just drive additional driving by single occupancy vehicles and increase greenhouse gas emissions, which is exactly the, the opposite of what we wanna see done. Um, Others have mentioned the potential to overload infrastructure and really no ability within the bill to address that. There are no provisions for additional funding or an opportunity to, you know, to say, wait, we can't handle this. There are provisions for water and sewer, um, but, th but they're inadequate. Um, and I think the last thing is, again, uh, you know, I think um, Director Flynn for raising the issue of where this, um, the, the duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, et cetera, are going to go. They're going to go to lower income communities um, with, that don't have the capacity to undertake this redevelopment on their own. And it is going to bring displacement. There, there are references to anti-displacement measures. Uh, I have not ever seen anything that is actually up to the task of preventing displacement. Um, those that I that I can imagine would deal with property tax relief to try to help people stay in the community as property taxes rise. Yeah. But but Dola doesn't have the ability to craft those. Local governments, our communities don't have the ability to implement those because of our property tax system. So I, the bill. Um, there are some provisions, again, I want to say that I think could be very, very helpful. And I think um, I would like um, those of us who are interested in engaging to really try to focus on those and try to make this bill good and would encourage the sponsors to um, to just delete the parts that are causing us so much heartburn and, and going against really the wishes of our communities. Thanks. Thank you, Director Levy. And I do apologize again for the mispronunciation. Uh, staff, if we could get a quick response on the floodplain question. I think there was one put in. Yeah, there's one in chat. It's... Uh, uh, yes, the um, parcels in the wildland urban interface or floodplain or those other exempt parcels would be completely excluded as it's written. The zoning wouldn't have to meet the minimum standards, nor could it be subject to the model code. How does that work with those floodplains that change every now and then? Uh, because you know, obviously floodplains are not constant over time. There, there, there are variations. How, how does that fit in? Yeah, it is unclear. I, I know there's there could be lots of um, designations that happen, even if a property is shown in the floodplain, uh, whether or not it is uh, above that, uh, uh, some sort of uh, distinction. Uh, so it's not clear. It just says within the hundred year floodplain. Um, so uh, according to to FEMA. Thank you very much, uh, Director Teal.
Thank you, Chair. Chair, I would have been fine if you would have mispronounced my last name. That would have been okay by me. Uh, Chair, I, I mean, we're, we're, we've got some interesting comments going on here. We're seeing interesting comments in the, um, in the chat. I wonder if it would be helpful to shape the conversation and uh, further this evening. And so if it pleases the board, I do have a motion to have Dr. Cog assume an opposed position on Senate Bill uh, uh, 23-213. I'll second that, Tim Dietz. You beat me. I, I would like to at least make note of the fact that our number of uh, abstains is almost equal to the number of folks that said that they oppose. Uh, can I, with your permission, Mr. Teal, can I ask briefly, those of you that abstain, can you raise your hand if you think that you would have a the ability to take a stand at our meeting in two weeks? If you could raise your virtual hand. And I know that's confusing the people that already are in there for chat, for questions, but Okay, so and I just raised that question that, that it is conceivable that we could have a greater majority in two weeks if we opted not to take that stand tonight. Director Teal, you certainly have the right to put in that motion and, and with a second, but I, I at least thought that was worth the, 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 the mention. Well, I appreciate that, Chair. And of course, um, you know, uh, when the question is called, um, obviously the chips will fall where they may, sir. Um, and of course, uh, we do know uh, this is this will be a, a position on a bill, so we do have our voting requirements that will drive that. May I speak in favor of the motion? Of course. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, and uh, apologies, everyone. My camera on my um, laptop does not seem to be working this evening, so you get to look at my smiling face the entirety of my comments. Um, uh, I speak in favor. I, I speak in favor of the motion for uh, Dr. Cog to oppose uh, Senate Bill 213. Um, at its very core, it is this presumption that we all do not know what we're talking about. Um, that you know we no longer um, share the trust of the population of the state uh, to make land use decisions at the local level. I would just remind everyone that this is, and this came up in a conversation that we were having at Colorado Communities and Colorado Counties Incorporated. Um, it, this is not necessarily something that's protected in the Constitution. Um, our local control of land use uh, was really enshrined through legislation in the 1970s, and it was by uh, um, uh, Governor uh, Richard Lamb. Who made that? And of course, I'm sure for those of us who are big history buffs, we're aware of where that political party relationship with. But it was extremely important for Governor Lamb that it was the people in the localities, in the local communities, who would have that land use authority and that land use capability. One of the most disturbing facets of Senate Bill 213 is the fact that it applies a use by right as we saw for these middle income, um, 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 single family um, um, shared properties, uh, duplexes, triplexes, row houses. And I think uh, many of us, we could probably look at what the development going on in our communities and we will see those developments occurring right now. Um, should there be more, should there be less? So certainly a conversation would be had, but this bill presumes that there are not enough of those forms of housing um, product in the market right now. I don't believe, and I, I come at this debate um, after several months of participation um, with a group that was hosted by CCI with the governor's planners. I don't believe there's a, at the very core of this bill, there's an appreciation for what a use by right means. I think there is the presumption um, by the planners, by the sponsors of this bill, that that use by right means that the places where where these housing products make sense will just very naturally occur. They'll naturally occur because local government is not going to get in the way. What I don't believe the appreciation is there for, though, is that a use by right means that we'll get these kind of products 
where perhaps it is not healthy for increasing transit ridership, where it is not a healthy um, uh, for the community to have these products built. These will be on the out, these could, as a use by right, be on the outskirts of our municipalities, on the outskirts of our communities, not within our urban cores, where we know there is a natural work and live uh, relationship going on. Uh, I think there is a presumption by the sponsors of this bill that it is going to uh, cause density around transit, density around areas yeah. that already have existing infrastructure. Be it water, Director Teal, yeah. if I could have you uh, wrap your comments up just so we can get to other discussion on the motion. Oh man, I thought I had a whole nother, I got a whole half hour speech here. However, Chair, I, I think those are the salient points for me. There's there's a lot to pick apart on this one. Um, and so I definitely speak in favor of the motion. Great, thank you very much. I am gonna go ahead and move through the folks that already have their hands up. Uh, if you have comments specific to the motion, otherwise we can come back to you after that point. Director Spear. Hey there, and sorry, I just got a little bit confused by your last statement. You're looking for comments on the motion? On the motion at this point, yeah. On the motion. Um, we, we do have a motion on the table. Yep, thank you. Um, I, I just think given how many people needed to abstain tonight and how many more would be able um, to vote, I, I would prefer that we uh, wait until um, the 19th to do that, to allow more people to weigh in. And whether whether that's because they're weighing in to support it or support it with amendments or to say no, either way, I think it um, gives more weight to the Dr. Cog uh, decision if we have more people who are able to contribute. Thank you very much. Director Shaw. Actually, Director Harrison had his hand up first. So yeah. I'm going to go to Director Harrison, uh, and his hand just went away. Thank oh. you. No, I, I appreciate it. I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, um, I, my view on it is kind of similar to uh, before, which is we had a breakdown of this uh, with our representative, our state representative, Jennifer Parenti, yesterday in our board of trustees meeting. And so there was a lot of questions that were asked. We spent quite a long time on it. And um, we had kind of equal separation of of uh, folks on the trustee board that had were for and some and, and against. And so the main thrust of where we came from was say, hey, look, it's good. It's better to be involved in the conversation to to craft and to change what is bad to what is good. And I think what I see here from all of us is we all share in the same concern for the most part about a local control B. You know, what does this do impacting uh, the plans that we have in place? And so I think what is most important that seems to be a theme in the background for all of us is what this does is create a sense of distrust with whomever made it, whoever wrote it, and those three sponsors that we're all it's generating conversation, which is good. This is very good, I think, in that perspective, and enabling us to craft what it really needs to be. So I'm we look at this, I think, from our board as this is a baseline. And then let's see where it goes from here. Um, I share we a lot of us share the same concerns about what everybody's raised here. And so I think to be a part of that conversation and to really put that forward is, is the major thing. I also one other thing is there has been no proof shown or facts that show that density decreases costs as Director Levy suggested earlier. And I haven't seen anything that's overwhelming. And for those who are in those low income areas, for them, low, you know, affordable homes are not 300 to $400,000. They're a lot less than that. And so that's, I think, the biggest challenge if you're looking at that demographic okay. and those and those salary ranges, there is an any product out there that qualifies for that. Even density, I don't think would even do that. And so um, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, and the board, we want to see what uh, what transpires, what impact we can make. And that's why we provided all of our input to uh, Representative Parenti to, to get back to uh, the group that's working on it. 
Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I do want to call attention. We are at 525. We can go past 530, although we do have an F&B special meeting. So I just want to make sure we are all sensitive to time as we move forward. Director Shaw. Thank you so much, Chair. I uh, would like to speak in favor of the motion which opposes Senate Bill 23213. Um, uh, uh, so many things um, that I don't believe could be fixed in this bill, like giving, uh, removing the right use by right, uh, throwing the decision making back to the local jurisdictions, giving local residents the voice in their developing communities. Um, so I would, it would be lovely to scrap this bill, to say no to this bill, and to allow all of us to sit down together and provide input. Uh, Director Levy's comments were, were spot on. I mean, local jurisdictions know what they're doing. Uh, we do the right thing. I, I will tell you that the city of Lone Tree, uh, who has, Currently, just over 14,000 residents has 2,497 uh, multifamily homes currently under construction. Um, we are, and they're near the light rail stops. We have five light rail stops. So um, uh, I think we need to go back to the, the drawing board. Thank you. Thank you. Director Levy. Thanks. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to say my name again to reinforce <laughs> it so that you'll remember. Um, no, I just I'm going to be very brief. I did want to just speak against the motion and and um, because I think we do need more jurisdictions to weigh in if they're not ready to right now. Um, and I think that there are opportunities uh, to improve this bill. Um, I think everybody has made really valid points with expressing concerns about the bill, but I think there are some very important opportunities within this bill. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not going to repeat those, but um, but I think we can all recognize that we're not doing a good job of coordinating um, planning for the use of, of water and valuable natural resources along those lines. And and really coordinating where, where is the housing going relative to where the jobs are going and how are we optimizing transit and things like that. And I think this bill is the vehicle to do it. So I think a motion to oppose um, would really throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think there's real potential to make it better. And I think we've got the best people uh, in, the, in the Denver metropolitan area right here in this meeting that can help make it a better bill. Thank you very much, Director Wheelock. Uh, yeah, I just like to say that I, I agree with uh, Director Levy. Uh, if I were, I, I didn't raise my hand at the outset when you took the straw poll to either support uh, or to oppose or to abstain. Uh, I mean, if I were going to do anything tonight, and I'm not sure it's the right thing to do it this afternoon, this evening, it would have been to amend and stay at the table uh, to work on a bill uh, and make it better and salvage one that is likely to pass. Uh, I do have concerns. I think that um, uh, Dola, although they're extremely talented, their task has not been to do planning and zoning regulations, and uh, and they serve at the pleasure of the the director serves at the pleasure of the governor, and so that's a pretty top down way to approach this. Uh, many of our communities have extreme demand for short term rentals and second homes. So and and we've seen the same thing happen that uh, that affordable housing has actually been removed to build housing with higher density that has been at much greater cost and been less affordable at the end of the day. Um, I had a number of other points down that we can that I can go on to, but I think the main thing is that we don't have the people we don't have everyone in the room that we should have tonight today. And um, and also, I don't think that we uh, I think we need to stay at the table by. Uh, taking a position to either leave it alone today or to uh, or to amend and uh, a substitute motion to amend uh, or one that follows this vote with an, with a motion to amend would be far more amenable to me. Thanks. Great. Director Baker. Arapahoe County is taking a position of amend. We um, have serious concerns with this bill. We currently have 108,500 dwelling units of various types already permitted for development within Arapahoe County, which could provide 
housing for up to 284,000 residents. I offer that just in the, to say that while counties are not in this bill, um, that's why we didn't take a position of oppose is because we are exempt already from this bill, but we wanna support our municipalities that have opposed, have taken positions of oppose. And, um, but right now our position is amend. Thank you. Director Fidham. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I uh, second Director Teal's motion. Right, and I apologize. I thought we had had a second at the time it was proposed. So, Director Dyack. Yes, you did have a second already. Okay, yeah. that's what I thought. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Parker Parker Meads is going to discuss this on the tenth. So, uh, just to honor my counsel and their um, our future discussions, I'm I'm going to abstain. Um, but you know this this um, this bill uh, seems seems very um, you know very comprehensive. Um, I I dare say overreaching. It's just it's it's a different approach. And in in government in different um, forms of government, uh, it it becomes how do you start a discussion? And this bill, the introduction, of this bill kind of feels like. Um, it's sort of a shot across the bow as to where, hey, we should we should really start this conversation. Um, I, I think to to address all the incredible comments that that we have had, um, we need time, and I I don't think time is our friend in this process. Um, thematically, um, you know, I think people uh, throughout the region have have indicated uh, we need a form, and I I think that's that's very appropriate. So. You know, to me, what, what I can what I can provide is I I think uh, we need time. We need a form. Uh, Dr. Cog is an excellent form. Uh, the governor has used us in the past uh, to uh, flesh out issues. Um, I think uh, Director Levy indicated. You know, we have some incredible people here, or we have access to some incredible people. Um, I think Dr. Cog would be be a very very um, interesting uh, form. To uh, to facilitate this conversation with uh, state as well as our local municipalities, and um, you know, I think all of us uh, are willing to roll up our sleeves and um, address. I think the overarching question is how can we uh, how can we help the environment? And to Director Flynn's question, uh, does density help, or can we? Create uh, more affordable housing. I, I don't know the answers to that, and I love to I love to get the research that Director Flynn is trying to trying to grasp. But um, you know, to me, if if I had it my way, um, you know, I think um, I think it's a it's a great uh, shot across the bow, if you will, to say let's get serious because I'm hearing a lot of voices that um, we're on different different ends of different situations here at the at the Dr. Cog table become aligned. And I think I think we do have the right people. I think we do have the right form. And we just need to get our state legislators to understand that we need time and um, we need to discuss this with uh, the locals as well as the states. Thank you. Thank you. Director Wheel. Thank you. I, I should start by saying that our city council took a position, uh, in fact, passed a resolution to oppose oppose the bill. I think that all of us feel that these problems are important problems, uh, affordable housing and, and greenhouse gas, and you can go down the list of things that the bill purports to solve. And yet, I think that the solution, well, first of all, the problem is, is questionably defined. I mean, even in the bill, page eight, they talk about the need being um, 65 to 90,000 housing units. And here we've just heard from Director Teal that we've got 108,000 already permitted in uh, Arapahoe County. So, you know, there's some, some question on the premises and certainly questions about, we, we've got these real problems, they're complicated, and we've got these solutions, and it's not clear that those solutions are going to solve those problems. Uh, I certainly echo the comments that th these are complicated. We didn't get here in 25 days. And to run through some legislation and have to react to it thoughtfully in 25 days is, I think, not a good process. 
Uh, and certainly there's no contemplation in the bill for unintended consequences, and they are large and myriad. Um, we'll be stuck with uh, parking street congestion and, and all kinds of other things that I, I could go down the list. I mean, emergency vehicles getting through on crowded streets, stressing utilities, many of these have been mentioned already. And I, I think if we're gonna be thoughtful about our growth in the region, we have to work through the problems as well as uh, the problems as this will cause as well as the solutions. Um, and I certainly resonate with the uh, uh, comments that uh, Director Maurer made about uh, uh, this is uh, sort of a violation of due process as well as uh, home, home rule and uh, the people that know where the bus stops are and, and where the dirt roads are and, and make decisions based on that local knowledge as opposed to the state coming in and saying, uh, we're here to help, you know, you guys are the problem and uh, and we're here to fix that. I, I don't think we're the problem and I think there are many good things going on um, already without the state's help. And I, I, I certainly would welcome the opportunity for Dr. Cog uh, to, to take, take a, a leadership role and, and get the dialogue going. Uh, but I do not think this bill is the solution. Um, that's all I have. Thank you very much, Director Sandgren. Thank you. I'm not going to repeat all the comments that we heard. Our council actually will uh, meet again on uh, next Tuesday, the 11th, to discuss this. I just wanted to say that I know that there's been many comments about if we take it a position of oppose that we're not at the tables. But I actually disagree with that. We're very much at the table. Um, many groups that have already taken a position of oppose are still having those conversations with the state legislature and governor staff. So I think that's a threat that we've heard in different arenas, but in the reality, I believe we're all still very much at the table. So I'll abstain from tonight's vote if we take that further, but um, we will be discussing next week. Thank you very much, Director Board. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I guess I'll start off with Broomfield City Council last night voted uh to oppose the bill as written um actually just outright oppose i shouldn't say as written um but i would actually support um director oh i can't find his name anymore but um uh, i would support postponing this vote until our next board meeting when more members have had a chance to discuss this and take formal positions with their councils and commissions. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Director Mulvey, is your comment on the motion? Yes, on the motion. My my listen to everything is that there we need to be at the table. It's a, the most transformative and greatest idea can still have structural problems and this bill has structural problems and to Jerry rig a fix, may not be the best and optimal solution for all. So I would support Director Dyack's view, but support the motion and support Dr. Cog engaging as a forum to create a better solution. Thank you, Director uh, Starker. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I would like to um, uh, propose an amendment to the motion. And I would like to propose that we oppose unless amended. Uh, as a as a position on this, uh, we discussed this at our study session on Monday night. We will be bringing back an ordinance uh, to oppose unless amended next Monday. Uh, I think there are several features in the bill that show some promise. I think uh, their uh, discussion on manufactured housing. I think uh, corridor densification, and uh, and I think transit de transit density uh, has some merits. Uh, I think, as we've discussed, there's some problems with the bill. I think a home rule, uh, I think counties uh, need to be included because they're an integral part of our urban area. Uh, I think the, uh, the elimination of parking requirements is uh, not a wise position at this particular time. I think the uh, provisions for un unre unrelated parties, uh, no limit on unrelated parties occupying uh, residential properties, uh, this bill is uh, is going to be uh, in committee tomorrow. I believe there are going to be uh, several, if not if not a lot of amendments proposed to the bill. Uh, I agree with the proposition that we should 
uh, a speak with a speak with a uh, coherent voice as Dr. Cog, uh, but I think we also, if we take an, an opposed and less amended position, we'll be able to stay at the table. I think we will see in two weeks what amendments are proposed and where the bill sits two weeks from now, uh, and I think that would give uh, our communities that need to have a little bit more discussion amongst their council and governing bodies to uh, to uh, understand and take a position. So. I would ask for a second on that. Oppose unless amended. Thank you. Is there a parliamentary parliamentarian in the house? <laughs> uh, we win. Yeah, win. Step in here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that is exactly right. There would need to be a second on the motion to amend. Then you would vote on the motion to amend, uh, and if that. Uh, passes, then we would vote on uh, the motion as amended. But you vote on the amendment whether or not you are going to uh, agree to amend, amend it as stated by Mayor Starker. But first, you need the second. Okay, great. Uh, with that, do we have a second? I will second, second for the state of discussion. I'm sorry, somebody else was jumping in. So Director Levy has seconded again for the sake of discussion. Uh, just briefly, we are at 20 till six. The F and B meeting, I think staff is kind of in the room letting people know that we're delayed. Uh, but you know, we will obviously finish with this this conversation. Uh, with that, uh, Director Shaw, I assume we have conversation on the amendment. Correct? Correct. And as chair, I will just make one comment that I, I I think CML has said there are so many things with this bill, it's tough to think of where you start with the amendments. I would again ask, I guess I'd ask the, the, the movement or, or others, um, when we say oppose unless amended, where does that list of what those amendments are that we would be expecting before we would change that position? I just think that's a challenge for us. Uh, Director Harmon. Well, I personally agree with uh, Mayor Starker. Uh, Idaho Springs uh, takes up this discussion April the 10th. So if we were to vote tonight, uh, I would abstain. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Director Teal. Thank you, Chair. So um, as far as the motion that's on the floor right now, and I, I really appreciate uh, Bud um, um, uh, offering that up, but I would ask us to turn to our executive director in terms of is uh, we generally have a laundry list of positions we would take, meaning support, uh, amend, oppose, or monitor. Um, uh, Per the motion by Mayor Starker, is there room in our normal process for a oppose unless amended um, uh, category of position? Question to the executive director. Thank you, director, very much. I don't know if Rich is on the phone. He might be able to address that better than me, but I think really what it is, it's an amend position. Is that right, Rich? All right, I think I'm unmuted now. There you can are. you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, I think I think that's fine. Um, I think we've done that before. I can't tell you exactly, but but we have definitely um we lost you. Are you there still? Mr. Murrow? Okay, Murrow? I'm back. I think I got cut up because uh they were trying to make me uh um panelist uh but yeah we've we've had positions like that before we might have stated them on occasion as uh like support or oppose with amendments um but i think i think this would be okay too to 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 richard staff as a lobbyist even how would that be articulated unless we have a comprehensive list of what those amendments would be I mean, is that something that, that we would need to be able to come to agreement and provide what those amendments would be that would be the opposed unless amended? Or is that unless amended just kind of a theoretical, hey, there's stuff we want changed, but we're not going to be specific? Are you asking me the question? I am. 
Okay. Or whoever, or whoever would like to respond. <laughs> um, I think that um, I would say that if you if if you take a position of amend or oppose unless amended, uh, the expectation would be you've got to have some something to offer, something specific to offer. Um, I will say, uh, and other Dr. Cox staff and others who've talked to the governor's office can can jump in. But my experience has been is regardless of all these other problems that we legitimately have, uh, they have, at least the staff we've been working with, um, have time and time again reiterated their willingness to continue to talk to us, to continue to work with us. There may be certain things we can never get to, I don't know, but I think that, um, I think there would be an openness to consider amendments. And um, I think we've all got some ideas uh, but but they definitely would appreciate uh, anything as specific as we can get. And Mr. Dr. Chair, based on that advice, I would be open to accepting that amendment as a friendly to the original motion. Okay. There you go. Uh, I wonder if Council Member Dietz would be interested in also accepting it as the seconder. Considering everything that I've heard, I do agree with the past um, conversations. I agree that many of you have yet to discuss this. I will say this, Castle Rock vehemently does not want this bill. And I also agree with uh, Director Deborah Mulvey that this cannot be fixed. You gotta start over from the ground up. And so I will go along with Commissioner Teal on this. I'm confused. That's a parliamentary question. <laughs> I might ask uh, Director Shaw. If it... Because what I what I heard from the second was that you don't believe that it can be fixed, yet you're agreeing to a motion that says. Well, then uh, let me let me reinstitute it as I would I would rather I oppose it. I'm going to stick to the first motion. Then that's really what I'm saying. Okay, so, so the, the, I'm not for a friendly amendment. On so that. the second is declining on the friendly amendment. Uh, Director Shaw, did you have have feedback or input here? Right. So, um, so if there is a if it's accepted as a friendly amendment rather than voting on the amendment. Um, uh, that that's certainly doable, but again, that would take a second. Right. Um, the, friendly, the, the, the second has not vote, that. Right. right. So we may as well simply vote on the amendment okay. uh, that was proposed by Mayor Starker. And if that is voted, uh, if there, if that's voted in favor, then we that would become the motion that we would we would have uh, before the body um, okay. to uh, oppose unless amended. If it fails, then we have the original motion okay. that we simply oppose, and we right. know that Dr. Cog can continue at the table. So at this point, uh, having discussion on the uh, possible amendment to the motion, uh, Director Cockrell. I'm trying to follow all of this. Um, would it be possible to simply table the vote and taking any sort of position until our next scheduled meeting to give a chance to hear the, the committee's amendments as well as give municipalities more of a chance to take formal positions? So that would be an amendment but we would need to vote on the existing amendment first. I wish so <laughs> if, if, if Director Starker's motion is voted down, then a motion can be proposed to uh, delay vote on this until, postpone this vote until next meeting. Uh, okay. Thank you. I'm glad you understand. We first need to take action on the possible amendment that would would add uh, the oppose unless amended, which uh, Ms. Bear Starker had brought up. Uh, Director Starker, do you have a comment on that? I see your hand is up. Yes, I do, Chair. Thank you. 
It sounded like we wanted to be a little bit more affirmative if we took an opposed and less amended position. Some of the items that I think that we would say we would want amendments on are the local control home rule issue, uh, counties, uh, municipal counties or counties in the uh, in the Front Range area or maybe across the state not being included. Uh, the parking requirements as stated in the in the uh, original legislation need to be addressed as and need to be amended. The uh, provisions on uh, the uh, number of unrelated persons that can uh, habitate in a uh, in a dwelling in an R in a uh, residential those are uh, some among other amendments that I think we should offer with an opposed unless amended position. Thank you. And I think earlier we heard some questions about right by use and some of those things. Director Spear. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to abstain from voting on the amendment as well, as well about a dozen of us. Uh, our Intergovernmental Affairs Committee here in Boulder did consider the bill this morning, and they adopted a recommendation for the full council to support the bill if it's amended, but I still can't vote tonight uh, because we we haven't had that discussion. Um, so again, you know, just want to, for, for those of us that are still in the process of seeing where we're going to stand, um, I, I would I will have to abstain and I'd really love it if more of us could vote on this. Um, I'm also hearing that there may be some pretty significant changes coming as soon as tomorrow. Um, so it could be helpful just to have a little bit longer um, for some of us to vote as well as to see what these changes are that are coming through because it sounds like at least what I'm hearing is that they will be significant. Great, thank you. Uh, Director Moby, I'll be back to you in a moment. I'd like to jump ahead to Jen Castle, uh, one of our, our hardworking lobbyists. Uh, for, uh, I saw your hand up, so take it away. Yes. Thank you, Director Conklin. I appreciate that. And hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things as it relates to um, the process and what is kind of happening down here. Um, so the bill hearing is tomorrow. Um, it's going to be upon a German of the Senate, um, and they are planning to hear a lot of testimony in both, you know, in favor and in opposition to this bill, and of course, those folks that are in the mend position. Um, it, it's kind of interesting. It's one of the only times, maybe the, my only time, that I have seen on the calendar that they're taking public testimony only. They're not going to take any action um, tomorrow on the bill, so it's really an opportunity for um, folks to come down and put things on the record for, you know, for how they, their position and their concerns or their support for the bill, that kind of thing. Um, there, I am also hearing that there are going to be several amendments. They will not be offered tomorrow. Um, they could very well be released or discussed to, to, to certain groups, um, but it's likely they will be offered next week and voted on by the committee. Um, so with that in mind, if we do or don't take a position, just want to put out there that tomorrow could be an opportunity if Dr. Cog wanted to get on the record um, with, with any of our thoughts and concerns. Great. Thank you very much. Director Mulvey. I speak in opposition. Thank you, Chair. To oppose the motion to oppose with amendments because we are a very big, loud voice. We can oppose now. We can all testify. We can submit written comments. And that will have the strongest bang for the buck as a body for our entire region. Most everybody that's spoken wants an amendment. I'm not sure that I've heard anyone who doesn't. If we oppose outright, we can always come to our next meeting with the amendments and take a position on that. We've done that many times. So waiting is really just saying, meh, I don't know. We should use our voice. We should not worry about oppose with amend when there's so many to do. We each have different voices. We have different things to say. We should each say them, take a position now with that strong voice to oppose it. So I speak against the amendment motion and for the original motion, please. Thank you, Director Bidham. And then we will go to a vote on the amendment. Um, actually, uh, Mr. Chairman, I was just going to call for the motion, uh, uh, call for the uh, vote on uh, Mayor Starker's uh, amendment. There you go. So what we are voting on is on the amendment, which would would change the original motion uh, from oppose to oppose with amendments, uh, with without specific amendments in that 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 motion. So 
Uh, I think the motion was to impose was to oppose unless amended, not unless to amended. Oppose, oppose with amendments. Thank you. Good, good, good correct. I appreciate that correction. Thank you very much, Director. Okay, with that, if you will, all in favor, raise your virtual hand. Can you restate the motion, please, so we know? The the the, the motion the the motion to amend is amending to uh, oppose unless amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And all in favor of the amendment, please raise your virtual hands. Okay, we'll give it a moment and give it a moment for uh, Melinda to count. Okay, if you can take your hands down. And now those opposed. Okay. Melinda, do you have what you need? Do we need abstentions? Oh, and abstentions. Right. So if you everyone would take your hand back down. <clears throat> And raise your hand for abstentions. Thank you all for your patience on this. So Melinda, do you have what you need? I do. Um... So we needed uh, 16 for the opposed unless amended to pass and it did not pass. Okay. So now we are to the original motion, correct? Any, uh, Director Nermella, did you have a comment before we go to the vote? Okay, no? No, it, sorry about that. No worries, no worries. Uh, with that, uh, do we have someone that would like to call the question on the amendment? Mr. Chair, I'd call the question, please. Okay. Is that George's motion? So the original, the, 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 yeah, the original motion, I apologize, not the amendment. So the original motion, which is to oppose. All in favor, raise your hand, virtual hand. Give it another moment. Okay, if you can take your hands down. All opposed, virtual hands. Okay. And if you could take those hands down, if you fit, Melinda, do you have what you need? Abstentions. Yes, I do. And abstentions. Or abstentions as well, yep. please. So raise your hand for abstentions. Okay, do you have what you need? I do. Uh, we needed uh, 15 to pass and uh, there was a favor of support or support of the motion. My apologies. I don't want to- So the motion to oppose has passed. Correct. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. But, uh, with that, Director Rex, um, what else do you all need? Well, um, I don't know. I mean, we we you know we're going to continue to. I hope you would agree, the body too, for us to stay at the table as much as possible and voice the concerns that we have with the bill. I think we all agree at the table that everybody is on the screen tonight is uh, in agreement that we have a housing issue concern and and uh, we need to find a way to fix that we're just not sure by based on this vote that this is the right approach 
So we'll continue to work with the state and see if we can find find an avenue. Okay, great. Uh, Director Teal. Mr. Chair, I, I don't know if this is uh, uh, would be a motion you'd be willing to consider, but in terms of procedures for our, our full board meeting later in the month, uh, we have heard uh, from uh, uh, Ms. Castle that there is likely to be other amend to, to be amendments uh, proposed to this bill uh, over the course of the next two weeks. If it would be um, if it would be worthy of a motion, Mr. Chair, I would have uh, a motion to direct staff to um, uh, bring those amendments back to the board for consideration of taking a different position once those amendments are right across the table with the legislature. Mr. Rex. Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, Director Teal, thank you for that, sir. Um, I believe we already have uh, provisions within within our regular meeting purposes to do that. We bring to you uh, positions that, uh, sorry, bills that we have taken positions on and we we always have the uh, the ability to change that position if so be it. Very well. Um, uh, it sounds like we're covered then uh, with the spirit of the motion that would have been made. Thank you, Chair. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, unless there's other uh, comments on that specific item, we will move ahead to just making everyone aware that there's an informational item in the packet on uh, fiscal year 2024-27 transportation improvement program, sub-regional share, forum recommendations. That's really just informational. We will have an opportunity to discuss more fully, but staff wanted to be sure that everyone had a chance to see that uh, as soon as possible before we get to the point of actually making those decisions. With that, uh, administrative items, our next meeting is April 19th, as my vision fades, and that is a regular board meeting. Uh, are there other matters by members? Mr. Rex. Thank you, sir, very much. I just wanted to point out, as the, as the chair has mentioned a couple times during, throughout the meeting, that we do have a finance and budget committee meeting right after this. I would like to continue that if all possible. We'll make it really short. Um, if we can convene at uh, 6.05, that would be wonderful. So you're not asking to continue the meeting, you're asking for the meeting to occur. To, yes, okay. asking for the meeting to Great. occur. I'm sorry. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, with that, thank you all for being here. Thank you, everybody, for your comments and, and attention to the matters at hand. Thank you, staff. Uh, and you know, just really appreciate everybody's vibrant uh, uh, conversation. And, and this has been great. And obviously, we will continue these conversations. So with that, I adjourn the meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Au revoir. Thanks, everybody. Good night.